people who are opting in are people who know what they want, so they're going to. In the opt-out, there has to be a default contribution rate because they opt-out. Someone who doesn't, someone who chooses not to opt-out is making a passive decision to sign up for 401k. So because they haven't taken any active steps with respect to the decision to, to be there at all, they can't make an active choice about the contribution rate. Yeah, yeah. I think like something you mentioned too is either if there's only two maximizers, they could do the opt-out thing, but it's 50%. You get all here. Right, but then they'd be paying the maximum amount of money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you don't think firms do things for their in, in their interest, right? It, it, if if you can find ways in which firms can do things to maximize their profit that actually also genuinely make everybody else in the world better off, score. But by and large, at this stage, most of the low-hanging fruit has been picked, and most of what firms do to maximize their profits is at someone else's advantage. Ah, that's too strong. I don't think that. Yeah. We, may, we don't actually know. We don't actually know enough to know whether we've made people, on balance, better off or worse off. We don't actually know. Okay? So my point is simply, the thing I want to emphasize is, um, you can say, I think, with reasonable confidence that this satisfies the no, the, the no restrictions or no coercion or whatever, um, the, the no restrictions on the choice set criterion of libertarian paternalism, which is fine, and it's certainly good enough for Dick Thaler, but it's not obvious whether or not it's good enough for uh, Kammerer and, and Lowenstein and Zakharov and, and, and Donahue and Rabin, right? the authors of the asymmetric paternalism paper, because we don't actually know whether um, we've made everybody, on balance, better off. Okay, fine. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to now see. So that was that was um, clever economists harnessing a natural experiment that was implemented more or less uh, not for the purposes of social science by a firm following its own profit maximization rule. Hang on a second. And now what we're going to see is. Um, clever behavioral economists saying, right, I think I can actually do something better than that, uh, both with respect to the firm's objective function and the individual's objective function and society's objective function by being uh, very intentional about how I design the policy. Question. What was the answer? Well, my answer is that it satisfies uh, libertarian, but not necessarily asymmetric paternalism. It might or might not. We don't know. We don't have enough information. It looks like the shove from 15 and 6 down to 3 could very well be uh, harming some types who, would have been, who are behavioral types in the sense that they're subject to default bias, but if you'd given them a choice, they would have made a choice that they prefer. Um, uh, sorry, so um, there, there's something important here, because I don't want you to go away with too... Uh, with an excessively strong conclusion. Look at these folks who are not in either group. These are people who are hanging out uh, over time. Their choices converge over time to the opt-out level of participation, which suggests that over time, people uh, pay attention enough to make an act of some kind of choice and opt-in if they really want to opt-in. Okay? So now this reminds me that there was something I wanted to say here. Um, possible psychological explanations for default bias uh, are, are many, but the main one that people have in mind is a naive present bias procrastination. Right? So there's some huge long-term benefit. I'm going to get, my employer's going to match 6% of my salary from now until I retire, and that 6% match is going to earn a huge rate of return over the next 30 years or so, and I'm going to not do that today because it's going to take me 15 minutes. So I'm going to do it tomorrow. All I'm really giving up is one day's worth of interest on a 6% match, but I don't make that much in a day, and an interest rate per day isn't that much. I'm not giving up that much. It feels like it's, and I'm discounting it, so it feels like it's worth the 15 minutes, but I'll do it tomorrow. And then you get to tomorrow, and you make the same decision, and you procrastinate. But you don't procrastinate forever. Right? So maybe you become more sophisticated over time, maybe you pay off the long-term payoffs, become more salient, eventually you do it. So maybe, uh, maybe we're just hastening a sort of process that is eventually revealed to be people's true preference. Yeah? So that was one of my answers for the, the other thing. I think you meant that, that you meant that again, but I didn't do that. Right, or you go to heaven or something like that. We don't know. Fair enough. So that's, that's, that's a payoff I don't have to worry about. That's already sealed in my case. Um, you don't know in which way it's sealed. But, um, okay, so here's Dick Thaler, who is, uh, despite all of my uh, in disparaging innuendo, uh, a truly phenomenal human being, um, comes along and designs a retirement savings policy, and by policy I mean a, a policy for a firm, not a government policy, using behavioral economics. Now, I want to draw your attention to this little object right here. Yes, Dick Thaler actually trademarked the name of this uh, policy. And when you read his paper, that trademark symbol is in the paper. You can do whatever you want with that piece of information about Dick Thaler. Um, Okay, so the field experiment is you design your own retirement program, you find a firm to implement it. Let me tell you, this has been extremely popular, it's extremely effective, lots of firms have adopted it, and it's baked into the Affordable Care Act. No, sorry, it's, it's baked into some other act whose acronym I don't remember. Okay, so here's the deal. The firm offers, the, I'm just going to describe the first implementation of this. Um, the firm offered their employees the following options in advance. Okay, first, would you like to meet with a financial advisor to discuss your retirement savings? 91% said yes. If your employer says offers you that, say yes. <clears throat> Second choice, would you like to implement the plan that the advisor came up with for you? Only 28% said yes. Third choice, would you like to implement Bernard C. and Thaler's alternative, which I'm about to describe, and when I describe it, you'll not be potentially so surprised that 78% said yes to Bernard C. and Thaler's alternative. Um, and here's their alternative, called Save More Tomorrow, and it goes like this. Okay, so you approach employees a longish time before their next scheduled pay raise. A lot of firms, if you're going to get a raise, you're going to get it uh, at a particular time. A lot of firms, you're going to get a, at least a cost of living adjustment every year. Uh, it's true at the university um, and, uh, and a lot of other large employers. So you come a long time before that next scheduled pay raise and you say, do you want to enroll in the company's 401k plan? And maybe you're enrolled already, but if you're not, do you want to enroll? If you're already in one or you choose to enroll, would you like to increase your contribution rate? Okay? And these choices are completely voluntary. So the question is, let's just abstract to just the people who are already in a 401k plan. Would you like to increase your contribution rate the next time you get a raise? And in particular, um, if you choose to enroll or increase your rate, the initial, deduct the initial increase, uh, increase in the deduction from, so it's called a deduction because we're taking money out of your paycheck, putting it into the 401k, the initial deduction will begin after your next pay raise, that's the same in the future, and will be smaller than the size of the raise, which means you will experience it as a loss relative to your reference point, a foregone gain, right? So my status, my, my reference point is my income currently, I'm going to get a raise, but it's going to be a slightly smaller raise, so I was going to get this much of a gain, now I'm going to get this much of a gain. So we're in the domain of gains, whereas if I asked you to increase your retirement rate right now, you would be in the domain of losses with respect to immediate consumption, okay? So put it in the future, put it in the domain of gains. Clever, right? Clever. Well, I probably, the answer is yes, that's clever. Okay. And then, let's get even more clever. Now we're going to get the wrong side of Andrew. Um, <clears throat> the contribution rate is going to increase with each pay raise until it reaches a preset maximum. I don't actually know what that maximum was, probably around 15%. So basically, once you've decided to do this once, you trigger this automatic sort of default, which is that every time you get a raise, your contribution rate is going to go up by slightly less than the percentage increase in your income. So you're going to ratchet up unless you choose to opt out at some point in the future. But guess what? You're not going to opt out because you have default bias. 
OK? So I'm now going to harness. Well, we'll get, you, you see what's going on. We're harnessing time preference. We're harnessing loss aversion. We're harnessing default bias. Um, and you can opt out any time you want. OK? So just like this right here, just that, tells us that this satisfies a uh, technical definition of asymmetric paternalism. You do whatever you want. OK? Yeah, because libertarian paternalism says, we don't know. Did I say asymmetric? I meant libertarian. Thank you. Sorry. Not only the computer is faulty. Here's the savings rate. Here's the results. Okay, so we have four groups. These are the people who did not choose to contact the consultant. These are people who are already at around 6%. This is a different employer. I don't know what their match rate policy was. So I don't know if 6% was a magic number in this firm or not. But these people were all sitting a little bit above 6%, and they didn't change that over the course of the first four pay raises. These are the people who accepted the consultant's recommendation. Previously, they were at 4.4%, and then obviously the, 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 the consultant recommended that they go up to 10%, and they shaded down on that a little bit and then hung out there. Um, and then these are the people who joined the smart plan. They had the lowest pre advice contribution rate. So these are, we might think, these are like the, the real beta types or something like that. And then what did they do? They ratcheted up in this delightful way, suggesting that they opted in, chose some step function increase, and then rolled with it over the course of several years. Okay? Um, they wind up with the highest contribution rate of anybody else. Um, and this is 51% of the employees. So this was something that was quite attractive, very effective. Very effective in achieving the goals of Dick Taylor and Shlomo uh, Benarzi slash the employer. You don't actually know how the employees fared, but the match rate makes it kind of, well, I don't want to talk about the match rate because I'm not sure how much this is driven by the match rate. This is a situation, and if you read what you will, libertarian paternalism, if out of the readings you're assigned, that's the one I really want. It's only six pages long. You'll find this quote, I wish I had it in front of me, where what they say, and if this doesn't turn your stomach as an economist, then I haven't done my job. They say, they, they talk about this no coercion thing, they talk about not restricting choices, but in terms of the no mistakes hypothesis, I'm sorry, correcting mistakes hypothesis, they don't make reference to social science research. What they do is they say, we think that there are situations in which most reasonable people would agree upon what is a desirable policy goal. Would not, most reasonable people would not object to this policy goal. This should, this should come to you as a trainee in the discipline of economic analysis, like a punch in the gut. Right? Because this has about the level of rigor of Hans Christian Andersen. Okay? This is not a valid analytical criterion. Okay? So we, we like the fact that this all looks very libertarian. Personally, I'm not super satisfied, um, personally, I'm, uh, I'm not super satisfied that, that this really satisfies rigorously uh, the criterion that they should be correcting people's mistakes according to their own preferences. Okay? So that's, that's my concern about this. Um, okay, so I've said all of that. Um, now, here's a, here's, a, here's, a, here's a different way of thinking about this, okay? about whether it's a good thing or not. So um, there's a thing called the replacement rate, which is when you retire, um, what percentage of your pre-retirement income will you be getting uh, from your retirement plan, the payout of your retirement plan? Okay, um, and the people um, in this group who joined the Save More uh, Tomorrow plan had initially a replacement rate of 50%. Uh, let me tell you, if you have the slightest degree of loss aversion, that's too low because it's going to suck to retire. Um, most people think that enough starts at about 80%, and that's where Save More Tomorrow got people to. So, in terms of what a very, very large, uh, long-standing consensus of financial advisors says is a good idea, this seems to be a good idea because it gets people where we think they ought to be, based on an enormous amount of experience with what's good and bad for retirees. Okay, so in some sense, we could say. Normatively, in terms of what we think people ought to be doing if they were rational, in aggregate, this seems to have gotten there. But we don't actually know what these specific individuals' preferences were, and we don't actually know whether the standard advice that financial advisors give to their uh, to the future retirees is based on any kind of social science research as to people's true preferences. All we know is that it's based in some notion of what's uh, an appropriate um, drop in your income at the time of retirement. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, as I said earlier, this now has entered into public policy at the government level. The federal government now gives tax breaks to firms that use save more tomorrow. Actually, the tax breaks, of course, the federal government will never take a genuinely good idea from social science and implement it without slightly breaking it. Um, so the way they slightly broke it was that. Uh, it doesn't have to be at the time of raise. Either it doesn't have to be at the time of raise or it doesn't have to be in the future. They broke a part of it. Um, but people, the government liked it enough that they made it policy. Fine. Um, what do I want to say about this? I want to say something else right, about this whole concept. And I kind of hinted at this when we were talking about helmet laws. Um, libertarians care a lot about whether or not you're intruding in people's uh, choices in ways that they might not prefer for themselves. Behavioral economists are, um, have become very interested in this because we think we've identified ways in which we can intrude into people's lives in ways that actually make them better according to their own preferences. So we're now in dialogue with libertarians um, in ways that are interesting and useful. Um, economists are typically libertarians, so behavioral economists are coming at this nice little intersection of, I want to make people better because I believe that people are irrational, but I was raised as an economist, so I inherently have this libertarian streak. This is very appealing to behavioral economists. It is to me. But I want to say that as a policy analyst or as a scholar of policy analysis, I can tell you that when you actually get to the level at which this kind of policy is made, you find that policymakers care a lot about things that are simply not raised in this kind of discussion. They care things about, about things like, is our national savings rate high enough for us to sustain economic growth over the next 20, 30, 50 years? They care about things like, is our consumption of fossil fuels sufficient to preserve you know, two thirds of the species on the planet over the next 100 years? At a certain point, you kind of set people's specific, you know, this whole libertarian thing aside a little bit and you say, we got bigger fish to fry here sometimes. Right? This is a country that at the time these studies were done had an average savings rate of zero. Right? This is not so great from the standpoint of macroeconomics. There are other reasons why you might like this public policy, whether you're a libertarian or not. I just want to say that these um, criteria of libertarian paternalism or even asymmetric paternalism are important. They are in the public eye in some sense at this stage, at least within policy circles. They are definitely interesting and worthy of our consideration. I just want to sort of pan back and sort of like in the, in the Star Wars uh, 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 metaphor, sort of raise the blast shield, right? switch to visual. There are other things that we care about in terms of public policy. So don't get too uh, focused on this stuff out in your actual personal lives. Okay. So what can we learn from Save More Tomorrow? Okay, about paternalism. So there's this big issue that uh, I think Andrew is championing in today's discussion. What do we really know about people's true retirement consumption preferences? Okay, so for Madrian and Choi, sorry, that's supposed to be Madrian and Shea, um, we can say, well, maybe people's eventual choices over time reflect their true preferences, and if we achieve that with an opt-out, uh, that's a good thing. Now, Bernardi and Thaler actually went with a supplementary study, and they explored, they gave people the choice between um, sort of the plan that they were currently in, the outcomes of the plan they were currently in, and the outcomes of some other uh, optimally chosen plan, optimally ac according to sort of typical financial advice. And what they found was that almost everybody said that they would prefer um, the optimally chosen outcome to the one that they were currently invested in, even though they were not told. Right? So here are two possible retirement plans with their outcomes. Long 
long-term outcomes, okay? Which one would you prefer? Oh, I would prefer this one, it looks better. Well, unbeknownst to the people being asked, this was theirs. This was their choice, and it was being compared to a financial analyst's optimal choice, and most people said, actually revealed from their choices that they didn't like the plan they were in as much as some other plan, probably closer to what they more tomorrow would get them. So there are ways that we can try to get at the mistakes hypothesis. We convince ourselves that we're doing something uh, legitimately in people's best interest. And I said this thing about should policymakers actually worry about people's true preferences. That is a conversation with a colleague named Shakar Kareev, uh, another member of the faculty here. Um, we were put in front of a group of people and told to debate, a little bit like trained monkeys. And, um, he came and he said, look, this guy's going to tell you that your preferences over how much gasoline or fossil fuels you want to consume aren't important. And I stood up and I said, you're right, they're not important. What I care about is whether the polar ice caps melt. And if you happen in the process of saving the polar ice caps and keeping the oceans from acidifying and destroying most of the life, on, uh, most of the life forms on the planet, I have to sort of uh, get in the way of your desire to drive your car. I don't actually care. Okay, so this is a legitimate approach to policy analysis. So just be mindful of that. There are other things that matter. What have we learned about uh, libertarianism? We have the situation where, in this case, for sure, rational types can opt out at zero cost. We really haven't harmed the rational types. The question is, have we harmed people who are irrational, but perhaps in the other direction? So they suffer from default bias, but the old default would have actually been better for them. We don't know. Okay. Uh, you already know that. And then we've learned some lessons about how to design public policy. Uh, I'm sure you all think that because this is the last slide, you get the last two minutes of your life back. It's not true. They still belong to me. Um, so what do I have to say about this? Save more tomorrow uses behavioral biases to nudge people in predictable ways. Actually, the important word in the sentence, from my perspective, is predictable, right? So I've been talking all along about the idea that if we can observe some psychological regularities in the way that people behave, distill them into some kind of simple model, that model should, A, explain behavior that we see in the real world, B, predict people's behavior in the future. And so what Bernard Fee and Thaler did that I think is actually genuinely brilliant is they came and they said, look, we have a model of default bias, we have a model of present bias preferences, and we have a model of loss aversion, and we're going to use them to predict that if we design a policy this way, we'll have outcomes of a certain kind, of a predictable kind, and they were spot on. So they, they were using a positive dimension of behavioral economic models in the process of designing a highly effective public policy. Um, and then that's a statement that is actually not correct. Uh, that said, you're now qualified to go and do problem set six, and actually this year problem set six was problem set five, so you've already done it.